Hey, good morning, and welcome to another episode of Between Two Nerds with myself, Jeff Doyle, and my friend and co-worker, Jeff Tansura. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Jeff. Have you, have, have you been doing well? Pretty good. Exciting news. Good, good, yeah. Yeah, how's the knee, go how's the knee by the way? Uh, getting pretty healed up? Yeah, so no brace. Started biking, so getting there. No skiing this season, but hey. Yeah. Well, I, I I'm not skiing this season either, but I don't have as good ex an excuse as a bad knee. I'm just uh, not skiing because I'm out of shape. <laughs> so. Um, so we'll yeah. plan next year. Yeah. My yeah. knee will recover. You will be skiing too. I'll maybe be, I'll, I'll be together, back to yeah. being skinny. Yeah. So we're going to continue. Uh, our discussion that we've had over the last few episodes, uh, and by the way, I, sh I should say thank you for joining us on uh, a different time than our normal uh, Thursday time slot with just some uh, uh, various personal uh, things going on that we needed to change the time slot, at least the slime slot, the time slot, at least momentarily. Um, and we've also been away for about a month for various things like IETF and, and, and Thanksgiving holidays and things like that. So, so we're back to it, but, uh, but thanks for, uh, joining us for another, um, episode and, uh, another episode where we, we are discussing data center interconnect and we're specifically going to start talking about, uh, multi-fabric and stretched VLANs and so forth. And I think it is um, uh, worth uh, talking about. Um, I was looking at the terrific slides that Jeff has put together, um, and I wanted to spend maybe 90 seconds just uh, uh, doing a quick overview because the uh, topologies that we're talking about are getting more and more complex. And I want to make sure that you understand some of the basic, very basic um, terminologies and, uh, that we're going to be using. Um, and so I might even drop back a little bit to CLO or CLOS architectures, if uh, depending on what you like. And, and Jeff, can you switch over to the slide that says VXLAN switching? Um, this has uh, the, um, yeah, we've talked about all this. There we go. Yeah, so what I want to talk about here really quickly is is I don't recall if we've ever really even talked about that before, about uh, just some of the basics of, of CLO architectures. Um, at, the, at the very bottom are what we would call um, uh, tier two or three stage uh, CLO architectures, which basically means just a bunch of leaves, which are also top of rack uh, switches, all interconnected, equally interconnected with spine switches. Um, and here's the difference between, thanks, Jeff. Uh, here's the difference between when we say two tier and three stage. Two tier refers to the fact that we've got leaf switches and we've got spine switches. So two tiers of switches. Three stage means that from any server in uh, in this CLO architecture to any other server, there are three switch hops. So you go to a leaf, you go to a spine, you go to another leaf and you're at the other server. Uh, and that's equal. That's one of the great advantages of CLO architectures. They're, they're equal across uh, the entire CLO architecture. There's no variability in how many hops you take. Uh, unlike older legacy, uh, uh, you know, hierarchical uh, architectures. Um, the number of spines you have are really determined by the number of uplinks you have on your switch port. So if you have a maximum of four uplinks on your, on your, uh, I think I said switch ports, uh, maximum of four uplinks on your uh, leaf switches, you can have a maximum of four spines. If you have six uplinks, you can have up to six spines. A lot of that, uh, those kind of determinations depend on what kind of uh, bandwidth requirements you have in your applications, uh, how much tolerance there uh, there is for uh, oversubscription and all of that sort of thing. At the spine level, 
Um, and by the way, these architectures, one of the big advantages is that you can build them with relatively small switches. Uh, at the spine level, uh, how many ports you have on your spine switch determines how many uh, uh, how many leaf switches you can have. So if you have a 48 port spine switch, you could have up to 48 leaf switches. And if uh, and again, these leaf switches are top of rack. So uh, if you have two top of rack switches per rack, which you really should, then those 48 uh, leaves, mean you could have a maximum maximum of 24 racks. Well, what happens when you grow beyond that scalability? And we've talked about that a little bit earlier. Then you go to either to what's called a three-tier or a five-stage uh, architecture where you have separate pods, which could be you know up to those maximums I've talked about, and they're interconnected with a super spine. Um, and you can see that in these illustrations in the slide. The super spine is a third tier. Um, and it also means that there is, that this is a five stage because again, if you go from any server to any uh, in one pod to any server in another pod, there are five switch hops between those two servers. And again, that's always uh, a maximum. So, that brings us up, and sorry, Jeff, taking up a lot of uh, a lot of our time there. Um, that brings us to the idea of what happens when we do data center interconnect. Well, what we've got with uh, these uh, multipod architectures is we're breaking up the control plane for scalability, but we still have a consistent uh, data plane. Um, that defines a fabric, an individual fabric. But now when we start talking about interconnecting these fabrics, now we're going to a multi-fabric architecture. And that sort of brings us up to what we want to talk about today. And uh, so we'll do a short recap of what we covered last time and go for Absolutely. It. So we started with a description of common DCI types over the top mm -hmm. in this case two different fabrics are being merged you exchange all the evpn routes without any filtering and your vx lan is end to end so you don't change next hop you don't change any attributes when you exchange routes between different fabrics what's also important to remember since type 3 routes are propagated end to end your flooding domain is now double wide and this is one of most significant limitations to this approach because now you need to replicate. And in data centers, we usually use ingress replication or head and replication, meaning the sender has to replicate all the traffic to every receiver. And it's a hardware limitation how large your replication group could be. So in this case, rather than replicating to other leaves, within the same fabric, now you're also replicating to other leaves in another fabric that join same service. So very simple approach requires minimum configuration, minimum effort to operate, but has limitations because it merges two different fabrics. It creates single failure domain, single flooding domain. DCI using gateways, usually used in cases where your one uses another technology and also if you need traffic engineering. Mm -hmm. So for example, normally you would do traffic engineering, something like RCPT traffic engineering or SRTE between DC gateways. In this case, you're actually going to reset next hop and you'll be using next hop on another side to build an LSP2. So when your BGP update is propagating over EVPN or LTVPN, if you don't stretch layer two, your LSP is going to be built from here to here. And you could do whatever you usually do in traffic engineering cases, right? You've got the controller or router itself that can compute LSPs. So in this case, you see clear separation of data center from the one domain. 
you are using the Xana VPN between usually border leaf and DC gateway and starting from DC gateway is completely different domain, usually operated by different organization. So if your company has such a distinction between different organization, could be a good solution for you. Another option, so all of them are described in RFC 8365. If DCI using AFBR, AFBR stands for uh, IS border router. In this case, EVPN is end to end. However, what happens at, at uh, AFBR, you normally would replace VXLAN subsolation by MPLS. Uh, we will do review of how route type two looks like for some example, and I'll show you how replacement is happening. So when you get to the remote guy, again, you could do traffic engineering here, you are resetting next hop and all the attributes. When you go into another data center, you will again change MPLS encapsulation by VXLAN. Why VXLAN and data center? Normally, I mean, to large degree, people don't do MPLS and data center. There's a variety of reasons. I think we covered them in one of previous podcasts but most people use IP and VXLAN encapsulation is IP UDP, so IP routing. So in all these cases, you're you're stitching together uh, different data planes, yep. right? Uh, which which gives you some obvious uh, scalable, scalability advantages and some obvious uh, design variability between fabrics. And there's resiliency. We use standard EVPN mechanisms. We will describe some of them in multi-pot, multi-fabric, stretch weeks and scenarios. And uh, I believe we have a question. Um, there we go. Uh, from Devang. Um, how are the how are the DC gateway routers connected to the fabric? Is it a, at a super spine layer in case of five stage? So the most optimized connectivity type is at leaf layer. You would like to provide as much as possible cross-sectional bandwidth towards DCI. So this is the most optimized case, not always available. In some cases, when you need to use DWDM, when you need to use something that's not available on smaller chassis, you see connectivity going to SuperSpine, for example. There's larger chassis that support uh, DWDM optics. So we will touch upon 400 gigs that are, but traditionally you needed a larger chassis with special hardware to accommodate DWDM optics. And in this case, you might start your uh, DCI out of super spines. The consequence of it, and in order to get symmetrical bandwidth distribution, you need to connect all super spines. If you don't, you will get a symmetrical flow into the fabric. If you connect border leaves, however, you just need to connect two of them for resiliency. For the rest, every endpoint in the fabric is equidistant because remember, when we go from one leaf to another in any fabric, amount of hops you're going to traverse is always the same. So if possible, we recommend you to use border leaves. However, it's an ideal situation. So if you don't, you do it someplace else. Make sure you understand the consequences of partially connected DCI. So if you do it on super spice, for example. Mm -hmm. I hope this answer your question. So short recap how transformation or interworking is happening. So route type two is a route type that's most fundamental to EVPN. It's used to distribute reachability to MAC or MAC and IP addresses. Uh, RFC has originally been written for MPLS. So what you see here is MPLS labels. In VXLAN, MPLS labels become BNIs. So in VXLAN case, MPLS label one, will be your VNI. MPLS label one is mandatory. MPLS label two is optional. And in some cases, when you use 
uh, symmetrical IRB with double uh, L2 and L3 VNIs, the MPLS label 2 will be populated with layer 3 VNI. So the one you would use for routing. When you do EVPN, in VXLAN case, in your data center, this is VNI. When you transition into MPLS domain, this is going to be replaced by MPLS label. Because what we do in MPLS, we use MPLS labels to identify service or IP address or MAC address if you do per MAC disposition. However, when you get back into VXLAN domain, you'll do back translation. So you will take MPLS label out of the packet and replace it with VXLAN VNI. Why is it important? Because the switch that's supposed to receive this traffic will be looking up VNI. VNI is a data plane field that's used by switches to identify where the packet should go to. Bridge domain, VRF. It's not really different than MPLS, but you're looking up something that gives you ability to immediately place packet into right context. Uh, we are going to switch into stretch VXLAN or multipod if there are no more questions. Um, there is a comment. Uh, hey, Orhan, nice to see you. Um, it says, I like Abster's approach to IBN. I like both of you, my friends. <laughs> okay, just a comment, but thanks, thanks, Orhan. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, uh, route type 4, which is normally seen in cases where you use ESI multi homing, is very important in multipod. We'll come back to that. So, why do we need VXLAN stitching? And depending on vendor, you would see multipot, multifabric, mostly on Cisco side. On Juniper side, it's VXLAN stitching. Uh, on Arista side, they call it integrated gateway. I reached out to Arista, I couldn't get any commands. So I'm just trying to derive what they're doing, right? Uh, I would like to especially thank Lucas Kratiger and uh, Michal Stravinsky for helping me. Uh, Lucas on Cisco side, Michal on Juniper side, getting better data and passing it to you. So thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. So what VXLAN teaching is doing is creating a virtual function that is a border gateway. So it's not a physical device anymore. As long as your ASIC supports this functionality, it could be placed on any device. So as I said, ideally on border lifts, because this gives you the best distribution. However, it's also important to understand some limitations. For example, in an access, when you use multifabric, every border gateway has to belong to the same ISN. In other words, if you are using these two leaves as border gateways, they would need to be in the same ISN. You immediately see the problem. Lifts should be in different ISs. If they are not, you would need to start playing with allow your own ISN and whatnot hacks in BGP. So ideally not. Before you deploy again, understand what will, what are the limitations of what vendor is doing. Going back into over the top DCI. So we said it's simple. You just share all the routes, but you create large flooding domain and large uh, broadcast domains. And this technology is specifically designed to eliminate this. So before we continue, you could use it to provide boundaries between pods. So in some cases, when data center is really large, you start building pods. And uh, if you look at hyperscaler size, it's not unthinkable of pod of 42. Yeah. even 64 racks. In this case, you would really like to build some boundaries between pods because every pod becomes data center on cell. This is where 
the exam teaching is becoming really important. I should uh, I should throw in here if you're if you're more interested in um, in uh, multipod uh, architectures or uh, five stage architectures, whatever you want to call it, uh, check out some of the things that Facebook publishes. They're very generous in how they design their data centers, uh, which are always some variant of of uh, at least modern times uh, of uh, uh, five five stage. Um, but have some unique qualities to them too. And, and uh, uh, there's some really interesting um, documentation that Facebook puts out. And Facebook is a typical example of company with really, really large pods. Yeah. So the difference, they don't need stretch layer two, which is specifically what we are trying to address here. But yeah, absolutely. There's great documentation. Uh, the document that describing migration from F4 to F16 is fascinating called the data. So do read it. Actually, we can probably share references after. So we said we could provide a logical segregation of pods within data center. We could also use it as basic DCI technology. In this case, you are agnostic of what's being used in the one. Your control plane exchange is between border gateways. So if the super spines are the border gateways, they are going to talk to border gateways on another side and this side. So if you have to connect two or three data centers, probably full mesh is good enough. If you are doing more, you really need to start thinking, how am I going to provide end-to-end -end connectivity between all of them? Very good approach here is to use route servers. So for those who don't know, route server is equivalent of Route reflector in IBGP. Mm -hmm. So in EBGP case, it will replicate all routes to its clients without changing any attribute. So it's not going to prepare its own ISN. It's not going to change uh, next hub, right? So if you connect many to many, start thinking about doing replication for control plane in such a way. So some attributes of the approach. As we said, uh, function has been virtualized. Now it could be deployed on any device as long as ASIC support. And ASIC support is the emphasis here because what you are doing now, you are re-originating the routes. So the fact that you are de-encapsulating the traffic that comes to you and re-encapsulating it into new BXLAN header. So not every ASIC can do it. Uh, work with your vendor to understand which hardware needs to be used. The control plane is end-to-end, -end. it's EVPN. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, nope, I still can. Okay, so end-to-end -end EVPN, we, apologies, we segment forwarding plane, so there's no end-to-end, broadcast, there's no end-to-end -end flooding. Border gateways are terminating flooding, re-originating flooding towards another data center or pod. So flooding is localized. And we are going to take a look at Anycast versus ESI approaches. Anycast is an approach implemented by Cisco NXS. ESI is ITF approach that has been implemented on Juniper, Nokia, and I would speculate Arista. Again, I am I know they're planning to do integrated gateway. We've seen the announcement. We don't know exactly what they're doing. For now, I would assume it's going to be ESI based since Arista has implemented ESI multi-homing about a year ago and it's working. So we'll start with ESI approach. As we said, the main idea is to terminate flooding within its local domain. So what's happening here, rather than having full mesh of VXLAN tunnels between all the leaves that participate in particular layer to service, the flooding is terminated on 
the gateway and then new BXLAN group is instantiated that is only distributed traffic to remote gateways. So if you remember daisy chain VPLS, same idea here. You segment your network rather than creating huge flood domains. Specifically to ESI approach, what you are doing is You'll be creating, uh, for resiliency reasons, border gateways groups that are going to terminate the traffic. From route resolution perspective, what you're going to see here, at local guy, you're not going to see any remote IP addresses, or not IP addresses, any remote switches. Anything that comes from remote is re-originated at the border gateway. Why do we call it ESI approach? ESI or Ethernet Segment Identifier is used for resiliency and load sharing across border gateways. We'll go a bit more details here. So what you see here, again, is segmentation. You've got localized here flooding within pod or data center, and then you have re-originated another flooding domain in the core. As you could see, you use particular combination of route targets, route distinguisher, and ESI locally to your data center or pod. When you stitch, there's specific interconnection instance that is going to be using different route targets, different route distinguisher, and different ESI. Replacement of VNI, which is the data plan identifier for VXLAN traffic, is optional. When it is downstream assigned, so when it's assigned by the receiver side, you would keep it the same. However, it creates same issues as you would have with over the top. You need an Excel sheet to have correlation between VNI to use across all data centers. So in order to eliminate these dependencies, now you could do uh, translation. So if you are sending traffic in this direction and leave here expects VNI 20,000, you could still be sending VNI 5010 here, replace it by potentially VNI used by your interconnect, but receiving I gateway will translate it into 20,000. So when lift three receives the traffic, it will have correct VNI. So lift three can look it up and do with traffic what it's supposed to be doing. All right, so you got the flexibility to decouple allocation of all the resources within different data centers or pod. Very important point. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at complete packet flow. So we always allocate or originate routes on right and send traffic to the left. So BGP updates are coming this direction, traffic is going to that direction. So when host to MAC2 originates its MAC address, it's going to go to its local switch. When we configure instance here, it will send type three routes saying, hey, I am part of this particular service, right? We do it for uh, uh, treating of uh, broadcast and non unicast multicast traffic. The gateway or actually all gateways here, group of gateways on border leaves is going to have same service configured. So this is very important point. Any service that you are going to stitch has to be configured on I gateways as well, because this is the way for them to receive the traffic. So since we have configured same EVI on L12 and L7 and L8, L7 and L8 have advertised type three route as well. So when L12 is sending uh, BAM traffic, it will also send it 
to both L7 and L8 because they have advertised that they are part of the same service. What's going to happen here is DF election. So we are trying to prevent both L7 and L8 sending broadcast traffic towards the core because it's inefficient. Both will advertise type four route that traditionally used here for DF election. Right? We don't want to send broadcast traffic towards host twice or three times. Same is going to happen here. L7 L8 run DF election, decide who in the group is going to send traffic towards remote data center and one. So if L8 is the winner, L12 will send bump traffic to both because everybody has to receive it in each domain. However, L7 will drop traffic. It's not going to send traffic in this direction because he is not the DF elected leader. L8, however, is going to send the traffic. It's going to be received by both L5 and L6 and distributed to the fabric. What we are going to see here is exactly the same action as happened on Ingress both L5 and L6 are going to reset RT, RD, potentially VNI to that of local data center or pod here. So when L1 receives traffic, it sees that it has been originated by L5 with L5 as next hub. So this is the routing part. So when L1 wants to send traffic when host one wants to send traffic to host two, it's going to look up, do I know who host two is? And since host two is the owner of the MAC address, it had distributed previously over BGP. Uh, L1 switch will know it needs to go towards this guy, right? So when it looks up the route, it sees number of attributes. Number one, route type two for this MAC address has been originated by L5 and L6 because we reset next hop here. Number two, since uh, we use ESI based approach, they're going to set ESI value in route type two route to that of this group. So L1, well, no, I can send traffic to either L5 or L6. Both are valid routers to distribute this traffic. It's based on ESI. So we'll uh, look into route resolution a bit later here. So it will send traffic to uh, ESI. ESI will get resolved into IP addresses or VTAPs on L5 and L6, which are going to be recursively load shared across the fabric. So traditional recursive resolution. If I want to go to L5, I can go through S1 or S2. So we call this ESI multipassing. It's based on the fact that ESI is eventually resolved into every switch that participates in this ESI group and then recursively resolved over directly connected switches, which in this case are S1 and S2. So this is pretty much how ESI works. As we said, it's a ITF based approach. What's very important here, potentially your border gateways could be from different vendors. So if you put Juniper and Nokia, they should interwork because approach is exactly the same. Jeff, do you have any questions? Uh, none at all. Um, uh, just just a bit of logistics here. Uh, in I don't know if we um, advertise. There's so much in in uh, what you're presenting here. We've uh, we are extending to about 45 minutes normal uh, rather than our normal uh, 30 minute format. Okay. So now we are moving to any cast approach. So as of NXIS 935, you could use kind of two different approaches. One is VPC border gateways based on traditional VPC technology. NXIS had been supported for many, many years, and we are not going to discuss it here. It's very similar to access facing VPC. 
DPC mm-hmm. is a multi chassis lock in NXS terminology. The focus here is any cast border gateways. So similarly to border de- gateway group in ESI approach, you've got a group of devices here that act as border gateways. What's important to remember here is that they must be in the same ISN number. There's a number of reasons for that. We are not going to go into details, but if you're thinking of deploying it on NXS, remember this is a requirement. So exactly same reason we want to terminate flooding within its own domain. The difference here ESI is not used. What's done here is that every device that participate in particular uh, border gateway group will have a common VIP IP address. VIP stands for virtual IP address. This IP address is going to be shared across all border gateways. When traffic or BGP updates from site one go into site site and go into site one the next hop for bgp updates is reset to that of vip so when any switch is looking up next hop for the for the route coming from site n it would see vip ip address as the next hop it's used for resiliency and load sharing somewhat similar to how esi is used in previous approach. A bit more details. So again, control plane right right to left, traffic left to right. When a leaf switch here is going to advertise uh, bump traffic or route type three towards the fabric, uh, border gateway group is going to change all the attributes and send it to another site. What's very important and how route type route type three is different than any other route type in any cast approach, it's not sent down with VIP as next hop. It's sent down with so-called PIP, which stands for physical IP address. So VIP is an any cast IP address that's shared across all border gateways. PIP is a unique IP address that is different on every border gateway. Why is that? Remember, when we receive route type 3, it is used to send BAM traffic. So we are going to actually build distribution tree that's going to be rooted at one of the border gateways because it needs to be built to a particular border gateway, we cannot use virtual IP address that is any cast. So it could go to any switch. So specifically to route type trees, they're always advertised with unique IP address. So as an example here, if this border gateway advertised it to the sleeve, when the sleeve wants to send it back to another pod or data center, it's not going to use VIP, it's going to use PIP, so the traffic will always go into the switch, not to the group. Let's go into traffic flow. So I'm trying to get from here to here. When I receive route type 2, it's going to have next hop set to VIP and could be either synchronized. So in a way we do it in over the top when we synchronize allocation of RTs, RDs and uh, VNIs across or could be local. So both approaches are supported. When we send traffic towards VIP address, same recursive resolution will take place. So we know that VIP is reachable through either spine one or spine two. So we could load share across them. From spines, since it's a any cast address, it's just function of local hashing to send it to one of the border gateways that participate in this group. 
So provides load sharing per flow, provides resiliency. So if one of border gateway is going down or get disconnected from the fabric, it will withdraw all the routes that have been advertised from here. So uh, uh, you're not going to send traffic to this switch. It's not part of border gateway groups anymore. So it's very similar to ESI approach where you use uh, route type one to, to withdraw the routes. So it's must withdrawal in this case. So one, of the, one of the things I noticed in, in uh, the slide, the previous slide there is, is that it's depicting within a single uh, site um, IBGP and route reflectors rather than uh, EBGP. Is that necessary to the design? Absolutely not. So it's a, it's a pictures taken from one of uh, Lucas's presentation and thanks for sharing it. Uh, you could use anything you like in the underlay here or overlay here. Any technology will work. From our perspective, we we'll always recommend to use EVPN mm -hmm. and unicast distribution over EBGP. There's a variety of reasons we are not going to go into, but at the end, all the technologies work. It just takes different effort and has different operational semantics. Sure. So as you could see here, they actually depict route server that takes care of distribution across different EBGP peers. So rather than creating full mesh across all sites, everybody will peer with, peer with route server and route server will distribute this routes to all its clients in exactly the same way route or reflector would do. So it helps you to scale and eliminate need for full mesh. Any questions? Don't see any questions yet. So uh, to compare two approaches, ESI based VXAN teaching is, is based on uh, ESI multipassing. So when we receive the route, the pointer is going to be towards ESI and ESI is set internal to pod or data center by border gateways. When we look ESI, it's going to resolve to all devices that participate in this particular ES. In this case, since it's set by gateways, it's going to be all the gateways that participate in same group, so particular service. So eventually ESI will be resolved to number of IP addresses or destinations on the border gate traffic should be sent to. Looking at how we get to these gateways, we can recursively resolve them over all links available to our spines. So we load share from leaf to all the spines available. From spine perspective, we would load share to all switches that are available in uh, iGateway group. We will use route type four to elect forwarder. So this is going to be the switch and the only switch in the group that's going to send bump traffic towards remote destinations. So ESI takes care of resiliency. It takes care of load sharing and we use DF election to prevent flooding of bump traffic towards remote destinations. Technology designed by ETF in ATF, and we see most vendors implementing this technology. There should be high degree of interoperability. So if you use two different vendors that use same technology, you should expect it basically working because it's nothing else done based EVPN on enhanced ASIC to support regeneration. Any cast based multipod uses any cast next hop in BGP updates to attract traffic towards border gateway groups, where any cast 
is used for load sharing and for resiliency because it's any cast if one of switches disappears you could still load share across remaining border gateways it uses exactly the same mechanisms to prevent flooding of bump traffic so internally it would run df election across all border gateways to choose a designated forwarder that's going to send bump traffic and uh, the only vendor we see this implementation is Cisco and XOS. So, so practically, it, you cannot use another vendor in the same group to provide this functionality. So is it safe to say that um, that that's the factor for choosing between these two approaches is is uh, for any cast base is is if if you need to uh, bring an XOS into the into the picture. So you need to make sure that all your border gateways are NXS switches and mm -hmm. uh, that they support this functionality because there have been some changes from release to release. From leaf perspective, it doesn't really matter because it's sending traffic towards an Anycast VIP address that's just an AP address. So there are no really changes on leaf layer. Yeah. Back to ESI, again, you could place any vendor that supports ESI-based VXAN stitching. What's important here, leaves need to support ESI load sharing. So because when you get route type two, it's going to have ESI set. It's not going to be zeros. So you're mm -hmm. going to use ESI to reach and load share across your I gateway group. Uh, all modern OSs or NOSs support ESI. On Cisco side, you need to pay attention that you're running, to my memory, 935. This is where Cisco implemented ESI. So you cannot use it towards hosts, but route type one and four are correctly understood, processed and load shared across. So you need modern, actually reasonably new NXS version for NXS leaves to work with ESI-based VXLAN stitching. So there are some dependencies on version of software you're using on an Excel site. Arista okay. supports SF, uh, dot, actually, I'm not going to go into really this. Cumulus supports <laughs> it since version 4.1 or 2. So anyway, if you are building modern data center, you should have all the support you need. Just make sure you're running correct versions of software. All right. Well, we're we are uh, about three minutes over our time here, um, and so we probably should uh, should wrap things up here. Um, got a nice uh, link at the bottom if you want to see the entire series that we've been doing on DCI. Uh, you can visit the Abster site, uh, abster.com slash DCI. Uh, there are also, uh, well, all of our um, live streams are uh, presented there. And uh, feel free to visit there. Feel free, please, and please do look at uh, our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, like and subscribe there. And, uh, and Jeff, thank you so much for... Uh, I, I've been very quiet through this because I'm learning a lot too uh, from this. And and Jeff Tansura is a deep, deep expert on on uh, um, on this topic. And uh, so so I've personally been really enjoying your presentation, Jeff. And and uh, um, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind words. It's a pleasure to share knowledge always. As they say in one of my most favorite countries, what you share is yours. What you don't share is it's lost. So <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Okay, we will be back probably in a couple of weeks, as far as I know. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be uh, sticking to uh, this Tuesday slime, uh, time slot or if we will go back to the Thursday time slot. But uh, 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 
you, uh, Jeff and I will need to discuss that and figure out uh, what works best on schedules, but we will certainly let you know in plenty of time. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. See you soon.